we've been um, much too harsh on uh, Western leadership in the last couple of days. Because if, if, there's, if there's one thing that it has provided us uh, over the last few years and, and the last 30 years, it's like a master class in absurdist theater, um, which we saw on display, obviously, to include the obligatory reference to the, the events of yesterday. Uh, but in a, in a larger way, throughout the course of the last 30 years. And so as I was thinking about this, I was trying to think about you know, what, the, what the most serious place is in the West, where the most serious discussions about the future of the West occur with the most immediate consequences, um, and, and test and see if absurd things were happening there as well. And this is the, this, I think this is an American perspective, but this is the, the White House situation room. So when this is the most powerful country in the world and in the White House, which is the most powerful decision-making place in that world, where the most important people with the best training, truly a kind of uh, multi-generational accomplishment of expertise where all of the decision-making capacity of the West funnels into a small room where, at, where, the, where, the, where the, the best advice can emerge. It's the situation room at the White House. And so you always see these very serious pictures. Um, I think there was one of President Obama sitting around uh, in a, with a number of advisors uh, ordering airstrikes or something like this. This is kind of the, the typical, the obligatory airstrike button in the Situation Room has to be pressed at some point. And if you put yourself in the mindset of the, the 1990s, this is an experiment I'm fond of, fond of doing, it was easy to see how this, this, this room developed the, the tactics that it did. Suddenly, at that point in the history of the, the modern world, there was no remaining world competition. So it was pretty natural in that room or in other similar decision-making circles to assume that the reason that we had won, the reason that we had become the most powerful uh, set of powers, US and, and Europe together, uh, was because everything that we had done was right, and it was by doing those things that we had achieved this result, and therefore, the automatic policy should be to do ever more of the same thing. So, for example, you know, we underwent a sexual revolution, and then we won the Cold War, and so we should have more sexual revolution, and that will lead to an even better world, something like this. And I'm not sure that that's the exact you know, line of reasoning that was going on in the room. And nevertheless, the type of decisions that Western leaders have made have always, at least over the last 30 years, been something like that. So you can imagine then that, the, that, that Western leadership, having assumed the, the, the principal position in the world after the, after the end of the Cold War, is sitting in this room and they have a set of options, a set of buttons that have been you know, carefully installed as the West has built itself up, particularly the progressive liberal West. Um, and they just start pressing them and hoping that the consequences will continue to strengthen their power. So, you know, the age of, the age of intense military conflict is over and so they all choose a kind of general demilitarization in the West. Great idea. There was the base closure program in America in, in the 1990s. We don't need any military bases anymore because we've won. All we need is to be able to export more American culture. So they, they obviously the actual situation room is about like, you know, everyday military issues. But the mindset of the, of, of the Western leaders led to this, 
this development of a, a kind of absurd set of options that were based on uh, you know, the, the way the world was for a few years in, uh, in a victory, in the victory at the end of the Cold War. And the situation is that the, the Western leadership, it's pretty much the same people, you know, it's a gerontocracy in the United States, and they're still the, pretty much the same people are still sitting there in the room pressing the same buttons that they were pressing in the 1990s and hoping that the same results will transpire. So in that world, for example, pressing the 15-day air war button was a, a useful strategy or, or military tactic in 1991 and maybe you know, put to dubious other uses later. Um, the, the, spread Western, the spread Western corporate brands option was one of the buttons. You know, after all of this accumulation of wisdom and seriousness, they assumed that by spreading McDonald's and Starbucks everywhere in the world, that would be the way of winning the hearts and minds of everyone to the, to the Western cause. And then, again, because we had undergone a lot of, uh, we had undergone the sexual revolution and that had led to more freedom, therefore there's no, uh, there's no, there's no like, we've achieved it, let's stop realization. It just becomes like a, a mechanical hit the button even more um, and, and, and hope that the, the even further advances of the, of the sexual revolution will lead to the accumulation of more and more power. And this has taken, undertaken, or taken on rather, um, a geopolitical aspect as well, that one way of exercising Western power will be through you know, spreading the LGBT ideology, you know, using a little bit of sanctions here and a little bit of you know, temporary uh, exercise of military power here, just a little bit, send a few advanced weapons, a few arms, and everything will be fine. Meanwhile, the entire world is falling apart behind them. And since we've been talking about free speech the last couple of days, I just wanted to, th this, this set of considerations made me think that, you know, it's not, it's not the problem around free speech or the fact that it's no longer really present in the Western world in the way that uh, a more classical conservative mindset would have would have supported it um, is is actually the sign of a, a much deeper problem you know it's not just that we're unable to or that we're challenged by you know liberal public authorities when attempting to assert basic truths about marriage or basic truths about the family but in fact when it comes to these strategic questions or these strategic decisions the, the making of really important decisions in the situation room where the smartest people are gathered, even there, they're not even asking the right questions. They're not even having a substantive discussion. They're not considering all of the, the factors. They're not forming a multi-year plan like the Chinese are doing, not even like in draft, but they're simply going on autopilot, articulating the same agenda over and over again uh, and hoping that this time it will work. This is evident even in the way that the, the concepts, the concepts that they use don't indicate or don't indicate the presence of a strategic mindset. It's like they're trying to come up with terms that will frame the debate in such a way that long-term and medium-term strategic questions aren't asked at all. So after the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't any kind of discussion like, well, we used sanctions a lot in the 1990s. Is the global set of economic circumstances today such that we can use them against Russia in the same way? Or like, what will the, um, what will the sanctions regime in the 21st century cause? No. Even to ask that kind of question is indicative of, uh, was according to them, indicative of a you know, dangerous, uh, dangerous softness toward Russia or something like that. Uh, instead, they just ask like, well, how can we press the, the sanctions button 
even more, because surely it will continue working in the same way that it did in the 1990s. And after it doesn't work, I mean, of course I would want it to work, but after it doesn't work, even then we can't ask the question, well, why didn't it work? We just have to cover it up. And unfortunately, this takes place on, uh, on it's easy to talk about the, the moral conservative issues that the, and the social conservative issues, but this is taking place more and more uh, on a geopolitical level or on an international level. Um, you even see this in the concept of de-risking. And this, there's, there, there's no, uh, no way to I identify what a concept like de-risking means. It's now used in the, in the international environment as a replacement for the word decoupling. We wanted to decouple from Russian energy. We want to decouple the European and the Chinese economies, whatever. It's not going to happen, so we're just going to pick another word like de-risking. But once they pick a word like that, that has no real substance that you can identify, it just allows them to keep pressing the same buttons and going in the same direction without ever having to stop and have a, a kind of strategic discussion or even ever have to answer the question like, okay guys, what's the plan? You know, what are the, what are the consequences of this? It's just an imperative. We have to de-risk. How could you be against de-risking? We de-risk our lives every single day. Every time you get in the car and buckle your seatbelt, you're de-risking. Why would you, are you in favor of risk? You know, it's like they, and they're, they're geniuses at this, but it, it's indicative of a very, very uh, deep problem. We also see this in, in discussions of European federalism. You know, like they're always in search of the Hamiltonian moment of the European Union because while well, America was a great and successful power and America pressed lots of buttons, again, uh, to get to that point, and therefore we should do the same thing. And the, the sad part is that it, it leads to ever more uh, pathetic consequences. Like the Hamiltonian moment was when in the, the 1790s, like the federal government took on a bunch of debt right after the Americans defeated the British building on a shared identity that had just been forged in battle to harness the, the massive economic potential that was just coming online in this new world. And the European Union's moment for this is like the COVID response. It's like, well, there's a massive pandemic and that will be the moment that we will finally forge a unified European identity by locking everyone in their rooms. I mean, it just, it just gets more and more absurd uh, each time. So there is, um, this, is the, this is the problem then, not just that we are unable to speak obvious truths, but that on a deeper level, important strategic questions are being glossed over. They're not even being asked. There aren't even forums other than this one and a, and a few others. Uh, in which they could be discussed because everything has become this kind of reactive uh, reactive politics, the politics of the of the situation room where we have to press the same buttons they, that we always have been. Um, so hopefully more occasions such as conference like conferences like this will allow us to break out of that bind. So thank you very much.